Hey bosses, it's Marie from Asian Boss. Did you know that there's only been two Indian athletes who won an individual Olympic gold medal in history? It's hard to believe, considering that India has over 1.3 billion people. In fact, at the recent Tokyo Olympics, Niraj Chopra from India made headlines when he won the second ever individual Olympic gold medal in 13 years. But who was the very first individual Olympic gold medalist from India? Today we're going to have a conversation with Abhinav Bindra, the first Indian athlete to ever win an individual Olympic gold medal. If you were curious about why India never seems to win a lot of gold medals despite being a superpower, and want to hear the journey of a man who went on to rewrite the Olympic sport history for his country, you will love this episode. This is the story of Abhinav Bindra. Thank you so much for joining today. You know, we really enjoy connecting with inspiring people from all over Asia and the world, you know, who can really empower the youth to stay curious. And you seem to have a great story on your own that we're very excited to hear about today. Oh, it's my pleasure to join in. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I look forward to an interesting conversation with you today. Yeah, sure. So first of all, for our global viewers who might not be too familiar with you, how would you introduce yourself? Former athlete, uh, five-time Olympian, uh, you know, the Olympic movement played a huge role in my life. It's defined me uh, of who I am. I was uh, the first Indian to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games in an individual sport. It happened at the 2008 Summer Olympic Games in my chosen sport of air rifle shooting. What for me is most important is what kind of a person I became in the process of achieving that uh, success uh, on the field of play. Um, I, I exited my investment of sorts. I retired from active sport in 2016. Uh, the Rio Olympics was my last uh, sporting event. And post that, I uh, run a business which is related to healthcare. Uh, I also uh, run a foundation, the Abhinavitra Foundation, which works uh, in areas of sport uh, in, in terms of empowering young athletes out of India, grassroots level athletes, young athletes, and um, leveraging a lot of science and technology into their training. I also am a member of the International Olympic Committee's Athletes Commission, uh, something which is uh, something I'm passionate about. So you're part of the IOC, right? Um, were you involved in the Tokyo Olympics this year? Yes, I was um, part of the Athletes Commission. Uh, it's an important commission there of the IOC because the IOC Athletes Commission really is the bridge between athletes uh, and, 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 the, and the leadership of the organization. It's very important uh, to make sure that uh, the athlete remains at the heart and center of all decision making uh, uh, in, in regards to uh, the Olympic world. Uh, so, yes, I uh, was involved uh, in Tokyo. I did not personally travel to Tokyo because there were a lot of restrictions on in Tokyo. I did participate uh, remotely in a few of our commission meetings uh, to just make sure everything goes well, and which I'm happy to report that I think it was a very successful Olympic Games in, in very exceptional circumstances. Let's go back to the very beginning. Like, how did you even uh, get into the sport of shooting air rifles? Is that even a popular sport in India? Or like, how did you get into it? Certainly not a popular sport when I got into it. Uh, it has, uh, of course, become a very popular sport uh, in the years uh, gone by. Um, it is a funny story on how I got into sport. Uh, I was, uh, as a young boy, uh, I actually hated sport. And, um, you know, uh, my only talent at that as a young eight or 10 year old boy was to miss physical education classes at school, which was a, a sports class in school. I was a little overweight, to be very honest, uh, hated any kind of physical activity. Uh, however, during this time, I was in a boarding school and I used to receive a letter every day from my father. Uh, and that letter had one thing in common, which was to try and play some sport. Of course, I didn't really listen to him and eventually got out of boarding school and moved to a day school. Uh, and I was just looking for a hobby, uh, looking for a pastime. Uh, and there I was introduced to my uh, first coach. Uh, um, and I went to my first formal training session. And I really loved the sport because uh, to uh, 
be somewhat successful uh, in the in the sport i had to just stand still and not uh, move around so that was uh, why it interested me as a young boy um, it was it was it fascinated me because it's, it's a very individual sport it's a very individual pursuit um, and you know you you own your success you own your failure it's in your own hands and that aspect of my of this sport really fascinated me wow so how old were you when you started uh, i was 13 mm, okay is that considered pretty late for starting a specific sport or is it kind of normal? no i think it's a it's a decent age to start uh, 13 14 i think is the right age to to get into sport i think research now tells us that you know when you're younger you should actually play multiple sports oh. you should involve yourself into several kinds of sporting activities because they build um, of course it builds endurance it builds balance it builds coordination so it's important to play many sports younger than that uh, and, and maybe specialize and pick a sport at age 13 or 14. Did you have any role models back when you were a kid who inspired you to dream big and actually compete at the Olympics? I did not have any particular role model, but my real role models were my mom and my dad. Uh, you know, uh, they, uh, they were tremendous believers in them. They were very hardworking individuals themselves in whatever they did at work. And I saw them struggle and work hard every morning. And they really became a, a great inspiration to me. Uh, throughout my life. Uh, sport always had a big role uh, in my father's life. He did not play competitively, but always uh, loved sport he, and always encouraged me to play ca some kind of sport. Uh, he was an athlete in his school times. He played hockey. My grandfather used to play uh, field hockey as well. Uh, and maybe that is the reason why he pushed me. How did you become so good at shooting air rifles then like how many hours did you have to put in to practice i started off by saying that i did not really have much talent i did not have much talent physically i was not athletic i did not have balance i did not have coordination i even had bad eyes uh, but i certainly had one talent and my talent was to work hard uh, and that is really what i did uh, i really believe hard work is uh, talent dedication to to your goals is another Uh, another talent, persevering is another talent. And these were my areas where I was, I was good at. So, um, you know, the shortest way to success really is hard work. And that is what I pretty much did for 20 odd years. Uh, my life revolved around sport. I would spend about 40 to 45 hours a week practicing it um, in, in their different elements. You know, uh, of course, the technical element, shooting, but also physical training, uh, also um, mental training, uh, working on uh, injury prevention, make sure my body was good enough to sustain for long periods of time. You know, the Olympics come once in four years, but for really for me and for most athletes, the Olympics really are every day. Because wow. what we try and really do is try and be better than what we were yesterday. Uh, and it is a continuous journey of uh, growth. It is a continuous journey of hard work and a continuous journey of getting better and trying to be the best that you can be. Uh, and pretty much uh, that is what I did. It was a lot of hard work, uh, a lot of uh, blood, sweat and tears. Uh, but um, looking back at it, that is what I really look back uh, with an immense amount of pride. That is what I really look back at uh, with a tremendous... Uh, um, amount of fondness and, and, and it was a wonderful journey which was all about working hard so hard work was what I did. In 2008 your hard work finally paid off at the Olympics right so if you could describe that moment um, where you realized that you won India's first individual Olympic gold medal in history, right? Especially because at that point, you probably knew that there hasn't been anyone before you who achieved that. So how did you feel in that moment? What went through your mind? Well, of course, there was a, it was a thrill of my life. Uh, uh, I think the greatest emotion that I actually felt was that of relief uh, because I had invested so much energy, time, effort, Uh, resources into my pursuit and I was just glad that I was able to achieve the success or the outcome that I had set myself up to 
But ironically, when I was competing in Beijing, I was somebody who uh, was very, very detached uh, and disconnected uh, from the actual outcome. Um, I went into Beijing as an athlete uh, who was driven by the process. Uh, I was somebody who, whose goal in Beijing was to be the best that I could in the 70 competition shots that I had. I had 70 opportunities uh, to be the best that I could be. It was all about learning to live in the moment, not living in the past and not uh, a girl living in the future, but really trying to live in the present moment uh, and trying to be the best that I could be um, every single moment of, uh, of that process. And, and really that was uh, what I really tried to uh, achieve in Beijing. And, and um, you know, when I shot my last shot of the Olympic final, which was a near perfect shot, I was just very, very happy uh, just to have been able to shoot the 10 best shots of my life in that Olympic final when it really mattered. The outcome was secondary. Uh, of course, it was an important outcome to, to, to get, but it was secondary. What was primary was the process. The primary was um, the focus on the process and the primary goal was to be the best that I could be um, throughout that process of those 70 shots. Uh, we had 60 shots in, uh, in, in qualification. The maximum per shot you could get is 10. Uh, the center of the target, if you hit the center of the target, you get 10 points. The size of uh, the 10 is 0.5 millimeters. So it's like a, a dot, uh, almost like the tip of this uh, uh, pencil. So wow. It's a very, very small target that we are aiming for in a distance of 10 meters. Um, after this qualification uh, competition, the top eight athletes went into a final where we shot an additional 10 shots. But these 10 shots were now scored in decimal counts. So, um, you know, if you just touched the, the center of the target, the dot, what I talked about, you would get a 10.0. And the center of the center, the absolute center uh, of this bullseye would get you a 10.9. Uh, so the scores of the final and the qualification were added up and uh, whoever had the highest uh, total in, in, in calculating both competitions was the winner of the competition that day. Uh, it's one thing to shoot the center of the shot when nobody's watching and then it is a totally different ball game when the whole world is watching. So uh, you have you also have to prepare for competition and, and, and the, the environment that one faces in competition. I can imagine that if you are in a hall with that many people watching you at that moment, right? What if somebody coughs, for example, like just makes a wrong sound or something and you can get easily distracted, right? So how do you keep that focus on that little target? Well, it is about uh, you know, a training for different environments. Uh, uh, in our shooting competition, we even have music playing in the background now. So wow. we have to get used to noise. We have to get used to audience. We have to get used to uh, many things that uh, can uh, take away that focus. It's about training. It's about training to uh, really enhance your concentration skills in different environments. You know, one thing I repeat is one thing is to have the ability to focus and concentrate when there are, when there is nothing at stake. But uh, the biggest distraction, and you know, you talked about noise and all of this, the biggest distraction really is your internal expectations. And when you go into competition and when you're supposed to stand and stay as calm as possible and stay and stand as still as possible, and you're shooting for the gold medal at the Olympic Games, your heartbeat uh, suddenly gets to 180 beats per minute. And then you're supposed to find that stillness of body and mind and shoot that perfect shot in that dot. Uh, so it is about really finding that balance and synchronization between your mind and your body uh, and then being able to shoot, um, uh, to, able, to be able to really perform um, your best uh, when there is chaos around you and you have to find calm amidst the chaos uh, which is around you and sometimes inside of you because when you're under pressure uh, you know there's adrenaline uh, which is released in your body uh, when you have adrenaline your heart rate spikes 
you know, in most other sports and in, in, in most other sporting disciplines, you have a channel to out, uh, you, you know, you can use this adrenaline to run faster or, or, or things like that. But here we are trying to do something where we are trying to remain as still and calm uh, as possible. So how do you use this adrenaline? You really can't. You have to find the. You really have to find that creativity then, uh, uh, and that strength and and, and that uh, adaptability and that courage from within. That even when you are full of anxiety and full of courage uh, or full of uh, this heart, pumping heart and you're 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 scared and full of fear, you still are able to focus on what you're supposed to focus on. And that only comes when you really focus on the process. You know, if you keep thinking, oh, now I have to win the gold medal, very difficult to achieve that success then. So uh, if you really invest in the process, then I think it becomes a little bit uh, easier. Has this mental focus helped you in any other life circumstances? Of course. I mean, you know, my learnings from sport, not just the element of focus, what all I learned from sport is useful uh, for my entire life, you know, firstly, you know, um, sport taught me what it takes to win. Uh, but more importantly, sport taught me how to lose. Very important in life is uh, learning how to lose and to, to stand up again, because life is full of ups and full of downs. Uh, sport taught me how to have a goal. Sport taught me uh, how to uh, achieve those goals. Sport taught me the need to work hard. Sport taught me the need to have integrity and honesty. Uh, uh, sport ta taught me to become a good listener. A very, very important aspect when you uh, thread through life and be successful in work or business is to be a good listener. Uh, and sport taught me that because I had to learn to listen to myself. I had to learn to listen to other people, sometimes who... Uh, with views which I agreed to, but also sometimes I had to learn to learn uh, to deal with views which were different from mine. For example, in my sporting career, I had um, several coaches and one of my coaches, uh, I did not have a good relationship with. Uh, he was somebody who always challenged me, always took me out of my comfort zone and always kept telling me things I did not want to hear, which meant that it created conflict and of course in early times of my career it meant a lot of tears and a lot of fights and uh, a lot of arguments but over time I realized that the person my coach was presenting a different perspective uh, my coach was trying to tell me a point of view um, which I might not be uh, comfortable with as of today so the, it this relationship taught me how to view conflict uh, in a very different manner. And many times uh, in my sporting career, I did not listen to him. You know, Maybe 98 out of the 100 times, I did not listen to him. But the two times I did listen to him, it turned out to be the absolute most valuable advice I ever got in my sporting career. Wow. So exactly how I do it in normal life now in, in business and, and things like that, when you know some people come to me and tell me something completely different uh, from what I want to hear or what my thought process is or is of today. I don't rubbish that. I, 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 I listen to it. I try and think, why is he saying that? Why is she saying that? What is that perspective that they are trying to bring forward? So I learned to listen to different views with a little bit of more openness, which meant that I became a more flexible person in my mindset. Uh, which is very important in life because in whatever you do, you have to always learn to adapt. Sport was my biggest teacher. Sport has been my biggest teacher. And in all what I do, uh, I, I try to uh, take the values of sport uh, to everyday life. And whenever I am challenged in life, which I often am, like everybody else, I look back at my time in sport and say, oh, how would have I... Uh, face this challenge if I were in a sporting environment and I always gain inspiration from my past, from my sporting career, but of course the values uh, through sport, of sport um, are uh, applicable 
to to people from all walks of life. So how did the nation, how did India react to your victory? Like, did, were you celebrated like some sort of a national hero because you were literally writing history in that moment? Yeah, it was a huge moment for my country. Of course, it was uh, an achievement which had taken a long, long time to come. Uh, we, of course, won another gold medal uh, in Tokyo, which was fantastic. We won our second individual gold medal just recently. Yeah. Um, but when I did succeed, it was it took me off guard, to be very honest. Uh, you know, the celebrations that were happening in India and just the enthusiasm and the love of the people uh, for my achievement and was, was something which I definitely was not prepared for uh, and had certainly not anticipated. So, yes, those were a very, very, it was a very special time in my life. And of course, um, at that time, I struggled to deal with it, as I said, because I wasn't really ready for this overnight kind of fame. You know, nobody really knew me. I mean, there was decently known for my sporting achievements. But when I won the gold medal at the Olympics, everybody knew me suddenly. Mm -hmm. And that I wasn't really prepared for. Uh, and it took time for, to adjust to it. It took time to uh, understand um, uh, this love and this uh, uh, respect that people suddenly had for me. Uh, it was a matter, it took me a year or two to really settle in into this uh, a new circumstances and that this new environment that I uh, uh, had to uh, navigate. It was certainly very, very challenging. But now that I look back, of course, I look back at it with a tremendous amount of gratitude um, for, for, for all this enthusiasm and for all this love and respect which was showered on me. Uh, yeah, again, a very, very special moment of my life. And uh, I look back at it again uh, with uh, tremendous fondness. I look back at it with also a tremendous amount of uh, gratitude because uh, the achievement was really uh, blown out of proportion to a certain degree because it had never happened and uh, uh, the reactions of people were uh, a little bit overboard but I can totally understand why uh, because uh, it was a long long wait for, for, for the country to, to, to win that gold medal in an individual event. After your victory, there's only been one more Indian gold medalist that happened recently, right? With India having this huge population of almost 1.4 billion, how come that there has only been two individual Olympic gold medalists from India so far? Yeah, I think um, you have to look quite deep into it. I think, you know, you spoke about the 1.4 billion people, uh, but uh, you really need to ask how many of those 1.4 billion actually play sport and play sport at uh, elite level and the answer will be it's a very very small number which actually uh, play sport competitively and you know sport was always almost looked down upon uh, in the past I think it's in a culture I think it is something uh, where uh, uh, academic pursuit always took precedence uh, you know uh, it was always about making sure you have your uh, your school college degree or your doctorate degree or your engineering degree and create a a uh, stable um, livelihood for yourself. So that has always been in our society uh, a priority. Why do you think this academic pursuit was so strong culturally? Uh, a sporting career is a very risky career in many ways because there is only one guarantee in it and there is, that is that there is absolutely no guarantee for success. You know, you can put a lot of hard work, but, you know, it's uh, very few make it to the top um, so having that job security and having that uh, socio-economic security through a career in sport uh, is, is a tough one to achieve. Uh, and I think that is where um, uh, the concerns and insecurities have lied over a period of time. I think what really needs to happen and it started to happen is really support uh, going into grassroots level athlete training. You know, the most important years of an athlete's life are when, they, when they're young uh, and when, they, when they're setting out to uh, make a career in sport, to be able to uh, really uh, lay a strong foundation, to have the right infrastructure, to have the right knowledge base, uh, to set that strong foundation. And that really has been one of the greatest missing links in Indian sport. But that is slowly but surely changing. Uh, we are now 
seeing a lot more structures come up in Indian sport, which are targeted to uh, grassroots level training, are targeted to younger athletes. Uh, and that is wonderful to see. Um, but that again, this, uh, this element has been uh, definitely a, a limiting factor uh, in the past for us. Why, why is that? Like, why was it so limited? Yeah, I think, you know, we, 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 we come from a country where we have many other challenges, uh, you know, uh, we, and sport has not been the uh, greatest priority. Uh, and that is, that is understandable. I mean, we have uh, challenges of education, of healthcare, of, of, of many other challenges. Uh, and, and sport uh, has been seen as a kind of a luxury. What we really need to actively do as a nation is to try and build a culture of sport in India. Um, get more people to just experience sport for the sheer joy of experiencing and playing a sport, not for winning medals or anything, but just get more kids to play and experience sport for learning the values of sport, uh, getting the health benefits of sport and just for the sheer joy and fun of playing sport. When those numbers increase, we will automatically see a number, that, that number increase uh, in the number of people involved in elite sport in India. And uh, when that will happen, I think success in Indian sport will, will, will uh, automatically will become a byproduct of this whole process, what I'm talking about. Um, we have seen a lot of improvements in, in, in sporting uh, structures in India. I think the, the Tokyo Olympic Games was our history, in our history, our most successful Olympic Games. I think we won uh, seven odd medals at the game. So it was success for us, another gold medal as well. Uh, so I think we've, we've, um, we are on the right path. What is very interesting is we are a very young country demographically. 50% of our population is below the age of 23. So never ever in our history have we ever consumed sport to the degree that we are consuming sport as of today in terms of viewing sport and also in terms of playing sport. Mm. Uh, so I do see that the next decade or so um, in India will be a decade of sport in India. And we, uh, we will see much improvements in, 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 in sport in India. And of course, also in our performances going forward. Even athletes now are able to, to, to make a better living and are, able, are given many more uh, opportunities. Uh, of course, if they, if they succeed, there are many financial benefits and financial rewards, which are also showered on athletes. So it brings in that uh, financial security, which is important, which is uh, critical to life, right? I mean, um, fame and gold medals are great, but uh, uh, they necessarily don't bring food on the table. Right, right. Because um, I could imagine if, let's say, if you grow up in some sort of a like poorer neighborhood, for example, like the last thing you think about right now is to like win at the Olympics, right? So how do you, how much do you think like the socioeconomic background of athletes play a role in this? I would actually, it's actually uh, to the contrary. Uh, I mean, if you look at um, many of our successful athletes, they are actually coming from very humble families and have very humble backgrounds because they are really starting to see sport as a way to better their lives. It is an opportunity to better their lives because of uh, the financial uh, benefits attached to success, jobs being offered if you make it to a certain level. So uh, uh, when you're at an uh, urban uh, urban level, urban elite or an urban, uh, say you're living in an urban setting, you have many more opportunities, right? Uh, uh, so that perseverance to stick to a sport for 10 years um, necessarily doesn't come uh, from from the elite you know very few uh, from those backgrounds actually invest that time and energy and effort for 10 years to, to gain anything but what we are seeing now in India if you map out our athletes um, that a lot of them come from very humble backgrounds because they, they see this as a way to support their family they see sport as a vehicle uh, to better lives their own lives so uh, uh, which is wonderful to see. That really showcases the real power of sport, um, that uh, how it can influence people's lives in a positive way, uh, yeah. and how sport is absolutely blind to who you are, what your faith is, what your culture is, what your bank balance is, what your religion is. Uh, that is the democratic beauty of sport. 
Interesting. So how was it in your case? Like, were you from a kind of well-off family or were you one of these people with a humble background? I was very, very fortunate that I came from a reasonably uh, well-to-do family and they supported me materially to, to provide for facilities, which at that point in time in my country did not exist and gave me opportunities to train and to compete. Uh, but more importantly, what they really did was support me um, uh, mentally and morally. And uh, um, that was invaluable. You know, during a long career of 22 years, there were many moments in this career where I felt hopeless. Mm-hmm. Uh, and every time I felt hopeless, um, my parents and my family, my sister and everybody around me continued to see tremendous amount of hope in me. Another fantastic thing what they did was uh, they allowed me to make my own mistakes. They never interfered in my sporting career. So uh, I had to uh, take my own decisions, of course, with my coaches and experts who were involved in my training. But at the end of it, I had to uh, be responsible for my success and for, for my failures. And that was invaluable as well. Because when you are in an Olympic final, Uh, and you have to shoot the last shot for the gold medal, one thing is certain, uh, and that is that you're going to be all alone. So uh, uh, you have to find that strength and that determination from within. And this was the way my parents brought me up. My parents always provided me with a psychologically safe environment, which allowed me to fail. Uh, And they were always there when I fell down and I needed help to get up again. Uh, you know, in, in sport, you fail many much, much more than you succeed. Tactical mistakes, training mistakes, strategic mistakes. But it was all part of learning uh, and it was all part of growth. Uh, and that was very important to, uh, to be able to make those mistakes, to be able to learn, to, to really learn how to fail well. You know, success in sport and success in life is all about failing well. Um, you know, you have to learn to let go of the unwanted baggage that failure brings, but you also have to um, learn from that experience uh, and then try and get better uh, at what you do. And of course, uh, uh, you know, I talked about failure, but my life's biggest crisis was actually when I succeeded. Uh, you know, when I won the gold medal, that was the toughest time of my life because I was lost. One fine day I achieved my goal and I was all dressed, but with nowhere to go. So it created that great success created a huge void in my life. I also had injuries and those were difficult moments as well. Uh, and then that is time, that is a time where you really need uh, support of your closed ones. The family and my parents, as I said, uh, supported me to a great degree uh, materially. But my uh, challenge, as I said, was a different challenge. It was not perhaps an existential challenge, uh, but it was a challenge to remain on course, on on the right path for a long period of time, because I also had other opportunities and other options to fall back on, uh, and uh, which is uh, for sporting success, you need to really be bloody minded to your pursuit for 10, 12 years. Were there any moments where you thought, oh, I'm going to quit this Olympic path, um, I'm going to go to this other option? And what was that other option? Yeah, I, there were many days, many times where I had um, encountered failure and I had uh, um, a lot of insecurity. And then, and the option was to, to, you know, to of course, I completed my education, but to just quit and then to get into business or to get into work life. Uh, and, and, and fall back on and, and start a regular life much far, uh, much earlier uh, than what I actually uh, started to. So um, that option was always there, but I remained true. I remained honest. I remained dedicated to my goal. I remained dedicated uh, to my struggle uh, for 22 years. And now that I've exited my investment of thought and uh, look back at my life much more dispassionately, that really is my greatest victory, that, that struggle, that, uh, that fight for 22 years to be the best that I could be. What about the society's attitude towards the Olympics? Like, was it always kind of small or big? Like, were, were Indians always passionate about the Olympics? Or maybe you started that trend to even make, excite people? I think it's changed over the last two decades. I think 
this particular Olympics in Tokyo saw the greatest amount of involvement amongst the Indian public ever in our history in terms of engagement, in terms of viewership, uh, in terms of enthusiasm for athletes, whether they win or whether they lose, just to support them and then to back them up, which was just wonderful to see. But of course, it has been uh, an evolution over time. When I was competing, there was a lot of negativity uh, surrounding our uh, our Olympic participation because we hardly got any success ever. Uh, and um, that always demotivated perhaps uh, the general public to really get enthused by uh, the Olympics. But it's changed and it's changed for the good and it's, it's wonderful to see. So now that you made a name for yourself in the global and Indian sports industry, um, what is your mission? How do you challenge all these issues that you just mentioned? You know, I've received so much from my sports career as a person, as a human being. Uh, and I believe uh, that it is uh, also very, very important to give back. Uh, my primary outreach to Indian sport is through my foundation, which is the Abhinav Bindra Foundation. Uh, we work in three pillars. Uh, uh, the first pillar being of intervention, where we give out a scholarship to very young athletes called STEAM. STEAM standing for science, technology, engineering, analytics, and medicine. And through our network of high performance centers, which bring in global best practice and cutting edge technology, we provide for all these facilities for very young athletes through the scholarship program. So that is, of course, an element which we've lacked in India, and that exactly with that intention to, to bring in those practices into India is why we started this particular project. I personally gained tremendously from these elements because I always saw great value in them as an athlete. I always had to look for facilities uh, from overseas, uh, which was always happened to become plan B because, you know, I was based in India and then to get access to this facilities, I trained uh, overseas for a short period of time. Then I had to come back to India and then uh, I didn't have those facilities. So it was always a plan B, but now really trying to work to make uh, those uh, facilities available and really make those facilities available for young athletes, for grassroots level athletes. Another form of intervention is a program called Sports for Her. It is a program designed for the female athlete to really nurture and, and train girls into sport. Uh, you know, the sports movement is also about achieving gender equality. And that is something I believe in, 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 in to a great degree. So we have a program focused towards girls, their needs, their specific requirements to achieve success in sport. The second uh, pillar of our work is education. It's not just about developing athletes, but it is also about developing the ecosystem that surrounds the athletes. It's also about developing world-class coaches. It is about developing world-class trainers, physiotherapists. The second element is leadership in sport. Governance in sport is something we've struggled to uh, bring in global best practice into in, in, into our country for a long period of time. So we set out a a program which uh, brings in uh, thought leadership and brings in global best practice to help our administrators and leaders involved in sporting bodies uh, improve uh, their day-to-day -day structures and create high-performance sporting environments. We got in partnership with the University of Loughborough uh, of the United Kingdom, which is ranked the best sports university in the world, and to help achieve this uh, particular goal. The other element of education is athlete mental health, a uh, very stigmatized subject and uh, was something I am personally very passionate about. I've done a lot of work personally in my role in the International Olympic Committee on the subject, being a member of their working group on mental health. But you know, within India, I'm doing a lot of work in advocacy and, and really creating, helping create psychologically safe environments for athletes to train uh, and compete in. The last and final pillar of our work is using the power of sport for societal good. Uh, our first program was an international program, which was done with a friend and colleague of mine, a former rival, uh, Nicolo Campriani from Italy. We're very good friends now. We set out to train three refugees to help them become athletes in our sport, chosen sport of shooting. Very happy to to tell you that two of them participated at uh, the Tokyo Olympic Games and it, this project was a wonderful social success. For so long in their lives, they were only known as, known as one. They had one identity, which was that they were called refugees. And today these two are called Olympians. Uh, so the power of sport has really shone in um, 
uh, you know, way of transforming people's lives there. The last uh, project what we are attempting in India are, is really to take value education, uh, to really use the power of sport, the values of sport, and take it to a larger audience, whether they play sport, whether they don't play sport. I think everybody has something to learn from uh, Olympism and from the values that uh, the Olympic Games brings and the values that sport brings uh, to the table, whether you're an athlete or a non-athlete, uh, whether you do a desk job of nine to five or whether you are a corporate leader, I think everybody can learn tremendous lessons from sport. And that is what we're trying to curate a, a youth leadership program, which revolves around these values. You mentioned you're also very passionate about the athlete's mental health. Uh, if you could describe the issues that a lot of athletes are going through when it comes to mental health. Yeah, I think athlete mental health has been always a very stigmatized uh, subject in the world of sports. It's very stigmatized societally, societally as well, uh, on a social level as well. But I think there's always been the great misconception surrounding athletes. And that is that we are immune to any kind of mental health or mental health issues. We're mentally strong and you know we're just really strong people and can't have any issues. But to the contrary, I believe that athletes uh, have far more triggers than you know people involved in other areas. You know, we have a constant. Uh, we have to deal with failure and success constantly. You know, people in jobs get appraised uh, once a year. You know, when your uh, performance uh, is looked into. Uh, but as an athlete, we are appraised every week when we go out and compete. Uh, and judged every week. So that has its tremendous pressures. There's pressure of, of training. You know, the physiological pressure that comes with training also has a role mental, mentally if you don't recover well enough. There is uh, a lot of uh, travel, constant travel. Uh, there's a lack of sleep, uh, you know, when there's constant travel. There's the pressure dealing with competition and expectations and anxiety associated with that. Uh, there are injuries associated in an athlete's career, which are tough moments mentally for an athlete as well. Uh, there's an impending end of a career. The transition out of sport is always a very challenging time in an athlete's career because uh, we, we, or we live very unique lives. We almost have two lives. One life is an active athlete, and then we have to start life all over again, uh, which is very, very challenging. There's a change in self-identity, and it takes a uh, takes time uh, to make that transition and adapt to those situations. So there are many red flags in an athlete's journey, uh, which could be potential uh, areas where uh, there can be mental health uh, issues and psychological stress that athletes face. Um, so uh, that is what the background is. I think what has happened over the last couple of years is a lot of famous athletes have come out of their own uh, problems and of the, have spoken up uh, about their own uh, challenging challenges, which I think has really helped in destigmatizing this subject and opening up important conversations with the whole ecosystem. Um, so it's been very, very critical. Also, the pandemic, I think, has been kind of a little bit of a silver lining the destigmatization of mental health mm. because I think it's been such a challenging time for everybody in society uh, mentally uh, as well during the course of lockdowns etc and isolation where people have faced mental health issues perhaps many for the first time ever uh, in their lives and that again has brought in a certain degree of sensitivity appreciation and destigmatization of mental health. And that has also happened in the athletic world and in the sporting community. And we are seeing a much greater push now to actually deal with the situation. Um, you know, uh, the sporting community and the sporting world, sports movement has perhaps been the greatest, in, greatest ambassador for physical health, right? Sport is all about physicality and being healthy and and there is absolutely no reason why we cannot also be the greatest ambassadors for mental health uh, as well. Mm. What was your low point in that sense? Did you have any like specific moment yet where you felt like your mentally, like your mental health suffered so much? Uh, was there maybe a specific incident? Yeah, I think I, I, the, the Beijing Olympics, the success was a hard one to, to, to deal with. Suddenly I had this great void 
you know, I was such a motivated person and one fine day my goal was achieved and that motivation level just uh, evaporated and then I was lost and I really didn't know what my next goal was and it took time and energy and that's where I really struggled mentally and I uh, was uh, fortunate enough to access help and I sought help uh, to get out of that uh, sticky situation that I was in at that point of time. Uh, and I've always been very passionate about this whole subject and that's where my involvement in mental health uh, in the world of sport uh, has been in the last uh, couple of years. You know, we're all about self-development and, you know, making the best version out of yourself. And it would be very interesting from, to hear from you as a, a former Olympic athlete, what goes on in Like, how do you get that winner's mindset? We've been talking about this hyper-focus. Like, do you have specific methods that keep you, keep your brain sharp, that puts you in that winner's mindset? I think there are many ways to succeed and there are many paths to success. And every individual has to find their own path and find their own way. But I would maybe like to talk about two or three elements which really helped me around, along the way. The number one element which really helped me was the ability to have learn and practice acceptance. Uh, you know, in many times in my sports career and in life, we are faced with many challenging situations where we need all that mental resilience to come into play. Um, and that normally happens when we are in a crisis, right? Uh, when we are in a difficult situation. Uh, and that's where we need to accept situations. Human tendency is that when we are challenged, we resist it. Mm. Whenever something takes us out of our comfort zone, we resist it. Um, and that just makes it much tougher. So I really trained a lot of uh, the practice of just accepting the good, accepting the bad, just trying to view success and failure with equanimity, uh, not giving one more than the other, uh, looking at it as two sides of the same point. The second element what I would like uh, to focus on is practicing mindfulness and trying to stay in the moment. Um, you know, success in sports, mental strength and this winner's mindset, what you talked about is really having the ability to cut off distractions. Either, you know, what we human beings tend to do is live in the past or live in the future. We very, very, very rarely live in the present which really is the most important time. But really practicing it, practicing it in everything what we do, whether I'm eating lunch, I, I, I practice on, on, on just being mindful to what I'm eating and enjoying that moment and enjoying the food that I'm eating, whether I'm talking to you right now, really putting my best into this conversation and being mindful to it uh, for the few minutes that we have together. So just practicing it in all walks of life, making it a way of life, The last element that I'd like to talk about is the practice of uh, gratitude. Um, very, very important. You know, we again tend to um, sometimes take for granted the many small victories that we have along the way. We all set very large goals for ourselves. Um, and along the way, we tend to forget to pat ourselves on the back when we achieve smaller goals. But it is very, very important to achieve even smaller goals in, 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 in life uh, and, and, and acknowledge them. Uh, and also being grateful for what we have today uh, rather than always worrying about what we don't have. Uh, mm -hmm. So combining these three elements really helped me uh, try and become the person that I was. Uh, that's what I tried to do. So we have a lot of young viewers from... India, from Asia, but also in Western countries. What would be your piece of advice to our viewers who might have big aspirations? Yes, I think, uh, you know, socially, uh, we've always been tuned to uh, look at work and play as two very distinct and separate things. Uh, you know, I brought the principles of work to play for a long period of time in my life as an athlete, and that helped me tremendously. But I'd also uh, like to reverse that. And I'd like them and all your viewers to take the spirit of play to their work. Uh, and uh, there is tremendous value in that. You know, it'll help build friendships. It'll help really build relationships. It'll help foster teamwork. Uh, it'll, uh, and in, in turn, it'll help you achieve excellence. And most importantly, it'll keep up that childlike enthusiasm that is needed Uh, to sustain success 
uh, for a long period of time. Thank you so much. This was very refreshing, a very refreshing conversation. It was very great connecting with you and I wish you all the best for your journey. Thank you. Great pleasure to be with you today.